My name is Timothy Hill. Brenda Hill, former owner of Chain Reaction. Well, I just remember I was working at the place next door to Chain Reaction. Then Kyle walks in. And says, hey, we'd like to do a church next door to Chain Reaction. Sounds like a crazy place to do that, but then he explained that he thought Chain Reaction would be like the perfect place for non-church traditional people that he wanted to attract. And I'm like, well, you know what? I've been waiting for someone to come ask me. And we had been like exhausted and pondering what our next move in our life was going to be and whether we were going to even close it up. And so when Kyle said that, we were like, I, I, think, I think we're supposed to stay here. You know, have you have a plan? Do you want to do something? But, you know, your plan is not always the right plan. It's God's plan. I said, you know, I'm, I'm willing to do it, but I need you to put as much effort into it as I'm going to put into it to make it right. And I'm so happy that we did it. It's just, it's just amazing. And you do it in God's time, not in your time. I have just seen families grow up, young kids come to church, find each other, get married, babies grown. It's just um, overwhelming. Uh, watching what a little seed, as they say, the mustard seed, got planted in Kyle and Lisa's brain and what it has materialized with the planting of the church here. I think I was just overwhelmed at uh, the people that came in setting up chairs, just what it took like to put it on. But um, it was exciting to watch it grow. My name is Don and my family and I first came to First Baptist Church of Anaheim in 1955. When I came here, the church was in a real growth spurt because of the growth of the city of Anaheim. And the church had decided that it needed to build a new sanctuary, which is the building of which we're sitting right now. After the growth of Anaheim, people began moving out, mostly to the eastern part of the city. And so we began to suffer a steady decline starting in the 70s until we got to the point the church could no longer sustain itself. The church needed to do something different and to change. And when the opportunity came to merge with the growing city church, we were excited about that opportunity of merging with a young, vibrant congregation. We were extremely excited to see the energy to see young people worshiping enthusiastically. It was exciting to see the children's ministries being renewed. Overall, it was an exciting time to see the new energy coming into this old building. to see the same type of atmosphere and acceptance of um, different walks of people and where you are in your walk. And to see that still being the growth and the heart of, of City Church. to see what's going to happen here in this community as the church continues to grow as a multi-generational congregation that will minister to all facets of reaching effectively the city of Anaheim. Pray with me. 
Father, we are so thankful for a new year. We are thankful, God, for the great things that you are going to do in and through it. God, uh, Lord, we just believe that this is going to be a breakthrough year for so many people here in this church. Uh, We believe this is going to be a breakthrough year for this church, even in so many ways. And so, Jesus, we ask for that. God, we ask that 2019, that you would open doors, God, that you would uh, give us access into people's lives and into their hearts that we've never interacted with. God, give us openness to do new things and sacrifice more and serve more where you want us to do that. Lord, we pray that the lost would be found in 2019. God, we pray for family members and friends who don't yet know your name, that maybe We invited to Christmas service and didn't come. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just continue to impress them upon our hearts, to continue to reach out to them, to continue to love on them. Um, And Lord, I just pray even uh, just that you would speak to us in new ways in our personal lives that you want to use us this year. God, we ask all these things knowing that you're already at work in them and you're already just moving forward. So we want to move forward where you move forward. God, we pray that you would open our eyes, that we would see what you want us to see today. We pray that you would open our ears, that we would hear what you want us to hear, and we pray that you would open our hearts today, that we would respond and become the disciples Jesus wants us to be, and it's in his name we pray, amen. You know, when we pray, we should have that kind of faith, that God is able to change our circumstances right where we are. When we pray, we should wholeheartedly believe that God is able to take the water and turn it into wine, that our God is able to take the problems of our lives and turn them into prospects for our future, that God is able to take the obstacles that are in front of you and turn them into opportunities for Him to advance you, that God is able to to take the disasters of your life and turn them into demonstrations of his glory. Let me ask you a question. What situation do you feel like you need Jesus to just come and rescue you? Delays are not always denials. And the same thing is true with God. You know, a delay in getting what you're praying about is not always a denial. You know, maybe God's teaching us something to wait on Him and trust in Him for an even greater fulfillment. Uh, You know, there are probably things that you've been asking God about for years and years and years. Maybe you've been praying for a spouse. Maybe you've been praying for for kids. Or maybe if you have grown kids who have wandered from the Lord, you've been praying that they'd come back to the Lord. Maybe you've been praying for a job. You've been possibly praying for a better job or a promotion at your current job. Maybe you've been praying for a, a better housing situation or a better car or a certain service opportunity to come through. Uh, maybe a degree completion or a restoration of a broken relationship relationship from the past. Some of you uh, might have interpreted the delay in hearing from God to mean that God is saying no. Well, I want to tell you something you already know and remind you of the fact that divine delays are not always divine denials. God might be deepening your faith right now so that when that thing comes, you will be ready for it. Tell you another story. I remember back in the days when City Church met at the little punk rock club off of Lincoln called Chain Reaction, and I knew deep down in my heart that God had a physical home for us as a church. I didn't know where it would be. I didn't know when it would happen. I didn't know how it would come about, uh, but I just knew it. So one day I was out there during a run worship time with my headphones in, the music blasting, and, and I was just asking God, Lord, how much longer? are we going to continue to have to wait for this? And I felt like the Lord back then put this analogy on my heart uh, that just ministered to my soul. Have you ever had that where you're, you're praying and God gives you something that just ministers to you before? And, and I felt like the Lord put on my heart just this analogy, just a few more laps around that track, Kyle. And for someone who was a runner, it just clicked for me and it made sense. God wasn't saying no, he hadn't forgotten about it. And, and you know, as a runner, you, you long and you wait for that last lap, right? When you know you're like, yes, after this rep, after that lap, I'm done and it's over. But when there's several more to go, you gotta keep chugging. Uh, you know it's gonna be hard. You're, you're not at the end yet, uh, but you're farther along than when you first started. And I just felt like God just gave me this perfect little analogy and something I can relate to. And, and you know, all throughout the Bible, it talks 
about the Christian life as a race that we run. And, and God builds our endurance and that we're to run it in such a way that we would win it. And I know that laps around that track are hard and strenuous, but you know what they do? They build up strength. They build up your breathing capacity as you go around and around. You know, some of you might be thinking that God is denying something good for you. And God might just be telling you, listen up, it might just be a few more hard laps around that track. You're on the path. You just need to keep running. Keep your head down. Keep looking forward. And that fulfillment is on its way. And in the meantime, God is building up your strength and, and appreciation so that when it does come, it will feel like Lazarus coming out of that grave. A divine delay is not always a divine denial. Hi, my name is Scott, and this is my story. So before Christ came into my life, I was selfish. I was very prideful, and I was very boastful. I didn't grow up in a household that had any spiritual connection with God. My dad left my mom when I was five, and my mom was always at work, so... I was kind of getting raised by the TV and by the guys in my neighborhood. You know, since I had a lot of bad influences in my life, I started getting into the wrong things and I you know, developed some addictions at a young age. So this is my journey on how I found Christ. I was working for Harvest, I'm still working for, working for Harvest. I was a, a chipper truck driver. Basically, we go around HOAs doing all the tree work, removing and trimming trees. Everything was going great. I considered myself a real good worker, a real hard worker. Um, there was like a real competitive macho atmosphere there too. So I was always like competing with the guys. I'll try to pick up the biggest trunks that I could. I was very much a show off. Little did I know that was gonna bite me in the butt later. Something happened where it really humbled me and that was I got hurt at work. I hurt my back. And then once I hurt my back, people started talking bad about me at work, uh, saying that I was faking it. And that's when I started getting a lot of anxiety at work. That's why I got a little like depressed at work. I started just, I just started hurting because I was not used to being talked bad about by people. So with all the anxiety that I was feeling and the back pain and the, like, the lack of energy, um, I, I fell back into an old addiction and I started drinking again. For a little while, it was working very well. I had a lot of energy. I wasn't feeling the back pain when I was chipping, but it got to the point where it started out as a little bit, it turned into an everyday thing. I kept telling myself, like, this is the last time I'm gonna do it, because I kept feeling like I was having close calls. And then it finally got to the point where people did notice. That's when I started getting really scared. I started getting scared I was gonna lose my job and then, you know, not be able to provide for my family. And um, at the same time, this was all happening. I was working with a guy named Edwin. He's a Christian guy. He's, he was the one who was telling me, he's like, yeah, bro, people think you're high or you're on something because the way you were chipping earlier, like you were doing some crazy stuff, blah, blah, blah. He's like, he told me before a long time ago, he's like, nothing works without God, bro. He tried to tell me that and I was like, yeah, be quiet. Like, I didn't, I didn't care about what he told me. So Edwin suggested that I go to church with him. So I went to church with him. And then one of these Sundays I went to church, one of the guys at the church gave me the New Living Translation Bible. So yeah, I took it and I didn't think nothing of it. I had the Bible, I, had, I hadn't really read it, I just read the introduction to Matthew. So something happened at work and I happened to have my Bible with me, I brought it with me, and I decided to go up on a hilltop at work. I started reading my Bible, but this was different than any other time. This time when I read the Bible, it was like the Bible was actually speaking to me. It was like God was speaking to me because it was, talking exactly about what I was going through. And from that point on, that's when I started reading my Bible every day and God started to speak to me through the Bible and then I, I started to want to be a better person. I started to want to be a, a better father. I want to be a better husband. Um, I started to realize how selfish I was at home. And that's when the more, the more I read, the more I realized like I need to start teaching my son. And I can be that father figure that I never had. And maybe my son won't get in trouble, go through some of the struggles that I went through. So I started going to church every Sunday. I brought my family to church, I brought my wife and son. From there, I started getting the want to get baptized. So I got baptized. I wanted to be a disciple of Christ. And from there, I mean, I started to be a better father to my son. I started to be a better husband. God really restored the love and the trust back into my marriage. I started using the word compassion. That word was not even part of my vocabulary before. I started making reconciliations with my family who I hurt in the past. Um, God started doing work in me. I'm still a work in progress, but um, following God is the best decision I've ever made. And that's my story. God's opinion about you is more important than the world's. You might feel like a failure. God says you have a hope and a future. You might feel like you're a loser. 
and you'll never do anything great. God says that you are loved and you can do all things through him who strengthens you. You might be so focused on your past mistakes that you think you're done. God says you can be a man or a woman after his own heart. You might think that your best days are behind you and God says they're still ahead of you. You know, even if you are sitting knocking on death's door itself, watching your physical body deteriorate, if you know the Lord Jesus Christ, your best days are still ahead of you. Hi, my name is Frances and I'm from County Cork, Ireland originally. And I would like to wish you all a very happy St. Patrick's Day. La Fela Podrick Sonnegut. That's it in Irish. So St. Patrick's Day is observed differently in Ireland than it is anywhere else in the world. St. Patrick's Day is a religious feast day. I've never known it as anything else where we attended Mass in the morning and banks and schools were closed as an observance of a man who brought faith to Ireland. The real story is St. Patrick was taught to have been a nobleman and he was born in either Scotland or Wales and so he wasn't Irish at all. He was sold into slavery at age 16 and he was shipped to Ireland to become a sheep herder until he ran away. He ran back home to England where he had a Christian conversion and he insisted that he would go back to Ireland to bring Christianity to the Irish. This was against the better wishes of his family and those around him at the time because they believed that anybody outside of the Roman Empire were barbarians and not worth converting. He went anyway. And he demonstrated his love of Christ by picking the simple shamrock on the side of the road and exhibiting the three leaves of the shamrock which are faith, hope and love, the Trinity. He did it very simply and his message resonated throughout the land. That is why we honor St. Patrick because he was a great saint who brought Christianity to Ireland. Not because of green beer or corned beef or anything else, it was all about Christ. And so I'd like to close with his prayer, part of it, not the whole thing because it's lengthy. It's called St. Patrick's Breastplate but it goes something like this. Christ with me, Christ before me, Christ behind me, Christ in me, Christ above me, Christ on my right, Christ on my left, Christ when I lie down, Christ when I sit down, Christ in the heart of everyone who thinks of me, Christ in the mouth of everyone who speaks of me, Christ in the ear of everyone who hears me. La Fela Padrick, Sonnegut, Happy St. Patrick's Day. The Gospel is for everyone. For the Caucasian, the gospel's for the African American, for Asian, uh, for Hispanic, Africans, Russians, Scandinavians, South Americans, Australians, Kiwis, <laughs> Filipinos, uh, the Cambodians, Laotians, the Americans. Man, the gospel is even for Canadians, eh? The gospel is for the rich, it's for the poor, it's for the powerful, it's for the prisoners, it's for the Democrats, it's for the Republicans, it's for the gun rights activists, it's for the gun control activists, it's for the straight, it's for the gay, it's for the transgender, the gospel is for the alcoholic, the gospel is for the depressed, the lonely, the happy, the sad, uh, the abused, the gospel is for the abusers. The gospel is for the disenfranchised. The gospel is for the privileged and for the elite. Uh, the gospel is for the young. The gospel is for the old. The gospel is for the skinny and the not so skinny. The gospel is for the beautiful and the just a little bit less beautiful. The gospel is for, help me out, everyone. That's what Jesus came to say when he said, and I, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I will draw all people to myself. Friends, help me out. Who is all people? All people. It's simple. And yet even today, 2000 years later, we struggle to understand who's included in salvation. Jesus came to destroy the premise of the question. He said, I'm here for everyone.
does this measure up to Jesus the good shepherd because he's the gate? That's a bold thing for Jesus to say, I'm the gate. Jesus' initial hearers would understood that when the sheep would come in, when they would come in past and through the gate, the gate was always paying attention to the sheep. Oh, this one is injured, this one's hurt, this one looks hungry, this one doesn't, you know, and knew, knew them, knew them completely and totally. Uh, I have a brother-in-law named Bill Taylor. He was a dairy farmer. He had a dairy, a uh, herd of dairy cows. And uh, it wasn't huge, I think it was 118 or 121 cows or something. I remember asking him one time, so what's it like? I mean, I see 118, 121 cows, they all look the same. What's that about? And he goes, oh no. I know every single one of those cows. I know everything about them. I see them every day, twice a day. This one here, this one will kick you with their left foot when you're not paying attention. This one right here, if you're not looking, will headbutt you. This one here, cool. He's again, he's like, I'm like, no, that can't be, that can't be true. He's like, no. I went out to his barn with him. He said, yeah. And he started describing each one. They all look the same to me, but the gate knows every single Jesus says, I'm the gate. He's saying something about his relationship and his attitude towards you and towards me. God created and loves you. Now, I'm gonna, I am a self-professed grammar geek. Where's my judgmental people out there who judge people on Facebook for using poor grammar like me? Anybody else? Like when you are like you and you're and you know, you get all that confused. I'm sitting over here needing to pray about my self attitude and how I feel about you. Um, I, it's just wired hard into me. I've been that way since I was a kid. And so this sentence that I just put up there is bad grammar, but it is great theology. And so God created is in the past tense and God loves is in the present tense. When you write, you're not really supposed to mix tenses in the same sentences. But that reality that God created us in the past tense and continues to love us in the present tense, though it's bad grammar, it is great theology. Amen? And just like every parent longs for connection with their child, God longs for connection with you. Speaking of parenting, did you know that, that 80%, it said that 80% of what a child learns and retains is actually caught from within their household instead of taught from the classroom. So you could send your kids to school and, and extracurricular activities and you can send them to Sunday school and, and youth group, but the majority of what they learn and retain is caught from within the household. So parents, it is vitally important that you intentionally invest in teaching and modeling to your kids. And, and the most important thing that you can do for your kids is to model godliness to them. To make sure that they are catching the good stuff, the God stuff. And, and know this, that parents, it's never too late to start. Never too late to start modeling godliness to your kids. I forgot to put my Mother's Day card in the mail. Hmm, what should I get my mom for Mother's Day? Ooh, you should give her that macaroni craft. Then again, it didn't taste that good. <laughs> I really want to get her something nice. Here, take this, it's cute and fluffy. Oh, thanks. My mom's cute and fluffy. Here are four things I love about my mom. See, pretty, warm, and cozy, smells like flowers. And my mom is so cute when kitties and puppies go on the internet, they watch YouTube videos of her. <laughs> That's so cool. My mom is pretty awesome too. She's actually sitting right over there. My mom is so fly. One time, Superman himself asked, is that a bird or a plane? And I said, no. That's my mama. Ha 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 ha. That's good. Hey, what do you guys think over there? Yeah, what do they think? Hey, cool shoes. Where'd you get them? I still need to get my mom a Mother's Day gift. Thanks. I got it at Ross. My mom likes Ikea. Did you know my mom is so crafty, she can build a working airplane out of Ikea parts? Ha ha ha. Did you know my mom is so pretty? I like to wake her up just to look at her at 2 a.m. Hee <laughs> hee. I bet she loves that. Yeah, yeah our moms, moms are great. Okay. Hey, that looks yummy. Do you think my mom would like that as a gift? It's just a piece of plastic. Oh, my mom's gluten-free. She's on that healthy lifestyle. My mom is so tough that the Ghostbusters give her a call when there's something strange and it don't look good. <laughs> That's awesome. One time, my mama got a call from something 
It said it was searching for life's answers. It had a funny name. Goo goo? Gaga? Oh, Google. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine that this face is your life. Anything that comes out of us comes out because it is inputted in us. So what you input into your life ultimately results at what comes out of your life. Sadly, in Christianity today, most Christians, they only get Sundays to input spiritual wisdom into their life, right? It's about one seventh, right? So the rest of the, the week, they get the influence and the input of other things, right? So Monday, you go back to work, bummer, right? And then Tuesday, you got school, bummer. Wednesday, you hang out with your friends that are, are toxic and influence you bad. Uh, Thursday, you get into a fight with your spouse. Uh, Friday, and you get it, right? So throughout the week, you're filling up your life to the brim with things of the world and you're only resting on what you got spiritually from Sunday, right? So this is what happens. The stresses of the world happen. The world, the pressures of the world happen. And what happens when you get shaken? What comes out of you is what you put into it. And you get shaken and what's coming out. So if somebody offends you, your immediate response is offense, right? If someone cuts you off, you get really pissed off, right? You want, if someone's rude to you, you wanna be rude back. And so you continue Whatever is filled inside of you is what overflows, right? But you gotta know that what informs you will form your actions. And so we need to be filled with the Spirit. We need to connect with God, not just on Sundays, but on Mondays also. We need to connect with God on Tuesdays as well. I got a great Tuesday small group. We need to connect with God uh, every single day where we're connecting and having quiet times with him, where we're reading the word, where we're getting into the scriptures so that we are filled with the things of the spirit and so that the things of the world start to get out of our system. And then what happens? Our life is a product of the overflow. What your actions are outwardly is a reflection of what happens inwardly. And so now, when the stresses of life happen, and you get into a fight with your spouse, you can respond with the fruits of the Spirit, with patience. Uh, when someone offends you, you can have kindness. When the stresses of the world happen, what pours out of you, you're like, oh man, I need, I need more Jesus in me. So that what overflows from your life will be reflected of what you're putting into your life, and it should, we should be filled with the Spirit. We should be filled with the Spirit. We need the Spirit in our life to operate. Be filled with the Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Without it, we can't do anything else. We need the Holy Spirit. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 says this, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. See, when we started this life, we were filled with all the gunk, right? But because of what Jesus did, he transformed us from the inside out. And so God wants to make you a new creation. And he wants you to go out into this world being a new creation, reflecting his righteousness, reflecting him. We are ambassadors of Christ. You are called into this world, but you are not of this world. You are a citizen of heaven. And we should be filled with the stuff of heaven so that we can bring heaven here on earth. Amen? I'm going to tell you something you probably don't hear in church that much. Sin is fun. Some of you aren't sure if you should laugh right now or not. And if you haven't had fun sinning, you haven't done it right. Let me tell you that, church. Here's the problem with sin. Of course it's fun. It brings a moment of pleasure, but the problem is that it brings all these other unhealthy attachments and long-term issues with it that are not so fun. And so what happens is a lifelong pattern of a hurt and long-standing bad choices so when God breaks a chain in your brain, I think we get a glimpse of the fact that yes, sin is fun, but God gives us a vision that His way is better. 
And yeah, that thing might be enjoyable right now, but God begins to train our hearts, not just for what's enjoyable today, but what's gonna benefit me next week, in two weeks, in two months, and in two years, and all the way into eternity. Belief in Jesus, the bread of life, it's not compared with tasting or admiring, but with eating. Jesus says that we must have him within us, that we must partake of him. So imagine seeing a loaf of bread. Seeing the loaf of bread is not gonna satisfy your hunger. Knowing the ingredients in the loaf of bread, it's not gonna satisfy your hunger. You know what, taking a picture of the bread, posting it up on Instagram, that's not gonna satisfy your hunger. Telling other people about the loaf of bread. Hey, check out this loaf of bread. It's good, but it's not gonna satisfy your hunger. Selling the bread is not gonna satisfy your hunger. You know, playing catch with the bread it might be fun, but it's not gonna satisfy your hunger. Nothing will satisfy your hunger until we actually take in the bread and accept it and eat it. See, he who eats this bread of life will have eternal life. There are so many voices that are speaking in your life, and it's so hard to hear and discern which one is which. So in your life right now, you have things like, like your job. Your job is, is speaking to you, right? You have your friends that are another voice that, that, that's in your life. Family, that's another voice that, that's in your life, right? Uh, social media, oh, add that in. That's a big voice that's speaking in your life. And somewhere in there, you got the Holy Spirit, right? And so when the stresses of jo your job start speaking, it starts getting crowded in your, in your life, right? And then your family things start happening, right? The stresses of your family work. And then your friends, they start distracting you as well, right? And then you add social media, and now it's just a wash. So many voices are speaking, and somewhere in there, the Holy Spirit's talking. So how can you hear what the Holy Spirit's doing? You have to silence them. You have to get into those quiet places so that the other voices can be silenced and that you can hear the Holy Spirit. Spirit is talking. The Spirit is talking all the time. But if you're not tuned into the right frequency, you can't hear what he's saying. And if you have, you have too many voices speaking and you're not in a, a place where you can hear only him, you will miss what he's saying to you. And what he has to say for you is good. There are plans to prosper you, plans to give you comfort, plans to give you counsel, and he wants to empower you. So you need to listen to the Holy Spirit. The Bible talks about the night before Jesus died on the cross, being just a little bit like this. Actually, the Bible tells us that Jesus prayed to his father, and he said, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He said, this feels so heavy right now. And then he remembered, you came here, Jesus came here to get his hands up so that anyone who would believe in him would have the opportunity to have their sorrow turned into joy.
so that by dying on the cross and rising from the grave three days later, anyone who would believe in him would have the hope of eternal life. Friend Christian, I wanna encourage you wherever you are, no matter how heavy it feels, look to Jesus, get your hands up! See, human sorrow in the hands of the Lord turns into divine strength. And see, when we give our our sorrow to him, when we give him the weight, something happens supernaturally in our lives where as we lift him up, what felt heavy gets lighter and it gets easier over time. And you learn to trust God in situations that felt difficult before. You know, I wanna tell you, Christian, you don't just show up to trials and tribulations praising God like it's nothing. No, you show up to church every week. You show up to your small group. You crack open your Bible on your own time. You spend your time in the gym of the Holy Spirit. And as God begins to uh, strengthen your soul from the inside out, when you get to that trial, when you get to that thing that is so heavy, God says, get your hands up. And when you get your hands up, he says, I will take that sorrow. I'll turn it into joy. And not only will God turn it into a joy, he will turn into strength for you in your spirit as you have learned to trust him every day up until that point in your life. Thank you. 
to love in the deepest sense of the term the fellowship of believers the gathering of the local church you don't have to go to church to be a christian i know that Uh, that being said i can't imagine why a christian wouldn't want to go to church because jesus loved the church up. Love doesn't give up. Love lifts up. Love believes the best always. Love doesn't drive people out. It welcomes people in. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. Happy birthday!